Hi, everybody, and a very warm welcome to this webinar, which is organized by INSEAD's Hoffman Institute and Change Now. My name is Ketel, and I head the Hoffman Institute at INSEAD, which has for a mission to integrate sustainability into everything that the school does. And I'm delighted to co-host this event with Kevin, who is one of the co-founders of Change Now, the largest impact summit uh, in the world. And uh, we have a partnership between INSEAD and Change Now. We've been having it for the past two years. It's been a good ride as we have the same vision to try to promote business as a force for good. And today uh, in this context, we'll be discussing uh, how to be a force for good to address the climate emergencies in, in different ways, from the top, from the top of decision making of organization, as well as from, from the bottom. And for this important conversation, we couldn't have had a better guest than Laurence Tubiana, who herself has been a, a change maker from the top and also pushing it uh, from the bottom up. Laurence is uh, currently the CEO of the European uh, Climate Foundation. She was France Climate Change Ambassador and Special Representative for the COP21, and hence was a key architect of the landmark Paris Agreement. We're going to be discussing about this with her today. She uh, most recently has also co-led the French Citizens Convention on Climate Change, a real bottom effort that we, will just, we were just discussing here while waiting for this discussion to start. And um, uh, more personally, I, I'd like to say that since I first met Laurence 25 years ago, that's a while now, she's been an inspiration uh, through you know, the leadership she's taken on climate change. And I was delighted to see that two days ago she received the, the award from the Royal Belgium Academy for um, World Climate Policy Outstanding Progress. Congratulations, Laurence, and a very warm welcome to you. Thank you for taking the time uh, for joining us today. Thank you, Katel, and very, very happy to be with you. Um, that's now a moment, and huh? we wanted to organize that discussion with your community. And I'm very happy to be here today, finally, even if it's weird formulas that uh, we are not, we are in 2G and not 3D perspective. I'm happy to yes, talk and about we're gonna all have yeah, to, uh, yeah, yeah. to do it from home. So just to, to start to get us started, um, Laurence, could you could you tell us about the Paris Agreement? Uh, you, you were the, in the heart of its design and of its political in, in, intricacies. So can you tell us how that came about? How such an international um, uh, consensus on a key topic came about and also, you know, where we're at today, uh, uh, five years uh, down the line? Well, the, the, at, at that time, when I, I, I accepted to lead the negotiation um, pre, pre, uh, in the two years uh, before the agreement, uh, I was rather pessimistic. I've been following this negotiation from now many, many years, as you noticed, Catel. Uh, and uh, of course, we had this big failure of Copenhagen in 2009, and of course, few few chances to, to get this right. And uh, of course, all my work was in a way to change expectation around that. And that should talk to business people or people who are really involved in what the companies and business community is about, is you, know, you direct your strategy, of course, based on your expectation of the future. And my job, first my job was how we change expectation, how we make the success possible and how, what is the meaning of this success? What, uh, of course, uh, an agreement is not, uh, you know, in international law, the problem is not so much to have a text and an agreement because the problem of enforcement is of course everywhere and you don't have a global government to make this happen. So uh, it, it has an impact if there is a strong consensus around it and around its objective. And second, uh, if people feel that this will happen. Uh, so expectation are everything and uh, I rely on the good authors um, that you say, uh, as you can have of course self-fulfilling prophecy that could be very negative, but they can be very positive. And that's of course the mm -hmm. argument. So what my, my job was really to say, uh, one, we have to have an agreement that put the responsibility of course in a fair way, but everyone, which was the first time because previously all the climate agreements were about the, the notion that developed countries should reduce their emission, developing countries not. So the idea that the 
development model has to continue business as usual for many until the certain level of development would happen. And the Paris Agreement philosophy was, that's not the way, we'll never get there because the impact are too, too severe and too, well, too dramatic for everyone. So the idea is not to do first, well, do the one who can afford a climate policy to go first, and then the second one would wait for after. But really we have to change the course of the development model immediately. And that was this, where this expectation was so important that uh, to change the mindset that the economic development has to shift from, it's based on fossil fuel and we may have a miracle in technology to change that. So we have to shift the base, the economic and the technology base to do something different. And it's not no development, it's a different development. So that was first to establish that and to get the agreement of developing countries that they could ask for support even, but to go in a different direction to, to diverge from the previous one. But of course, having a clear commitment of, a, of the global goals that mean something. And the difference between the previous agreement and this one was to say, we have to go to zero emission by 2050 or around that. And to go to zero emission is not, oh, we will decrease progressively or we'll do incremental steps, but it is, we have to go to zero. And zero is zero. I mean, you, you can't continue like before. And so that was a second important element, even if this one was negotiated at the last minute on the Saturday morning, uh, with, of course, I suppose some countries didn't understand exactly what they were signing for, what does the meaning was. <laughs> because, um, but that was the idea that, uh, and, and because this is very difficult to, to get, uh, to go to zero when you are at the levels we are like, I don't know, uh, 11 tons per capita in France, when you count the, the, <clears throat> the imported emission or the 26 or 27 just purely produced on the American soil or, or even of course, higher, high, higher now, 12, I think, or, or we are around 12 or, or in, in China. So how you go to zero <clears throat> is, uh, is, of course, stressful. So that's why the Paris Agreement introduced a sequence approach where it's a learning process. You begin by, of course, more moderate objective, and then you increase them over time with a based on the peer review. And so the idea, the, the mechanism, which is very central to to Paris Agreement is these global goals, including finance. I will come back to that later. Mm -hmm. But as I said, several steps where uh, countries revise their climate plans and because there is more the, the orientation of the glo global economy is going in that direction because technology is there, because you learn how to do things, you can improve your action over time. And so that's the two elements, a very ambitious goal and the learning process throughout. And again, always, shaping the expectation that this will happen, so we have to prepare. And I can see, we, we can talk about the, the impact these days, but I see that uh, uh, it has had a profound impact because now the zero emission by 2050 or around that uh, is very not now embedded in many, many visions. And finally, the idea was government cannot do that alone. It's about the economy-wide problem. Uh, so if you don't have the other actors, involved and buying in this objective of the Paris Agreement will never get any result because again, there will not be no force. You will not invade the country to make it implement its targets or you will not force the companies to reduce emissions. So uh, this goal, this expectation has to be shared. And that's why I insisted on having in the political package prepared a, a, a particular pillar organized around cities and business. And uh, so I mean, the local level on one side, because of course that's where a lot of choices have been made and the business, uh, because again, many choices are, are done in a decentralized way. And you know, in international theory, uh, relation theory, we have this notion of a regime where you have very different actors that can finally be coordinated because they share a number of norms uh, so that was, of course, for me, a very central notion, but well, not only norms, but again, coupled with expectation and a sort of a very active discussion between the different levels, the cities, the business, the government, to make this conception, this representation 
more active and changing over time. And so, so that was basically the philosophy. And then I, I, of course, I will not go in the details, which are not that interesting, but when legal details data is necessary for that. But what is important is there is, a, of course, a chapter of recognition in the decision in Paris that the non-state actors have a very, very important role to play. And we even designed, crafted a role that was what we call the champion, the climate champion to, in a way, be uh, the, the driver of that dynamic. And then now more and more in the COPs, you see that the most important elements are happening in the non-state actor space and not in the governmental space now, of course, because the negotiation is over. So that is the different facet of the Paris Agreement, if I may say so. And, and Laurence, so hello, hello, uh, Catherine and Laurence. I'm really happy to be, to be here with you. So uh, in your opinion, we are now in 2020, so five years later, um, what, what is, you know, what's your uh, evaluation of the situation? Is it, uh, uh, is it promising according to you or what are the aspects that, that, uh, that, that you feel are, are still challenging at the time? Of course, a lot, a lot of challenges, in particular the, the rise in emissions even the, the, the rise have been you know, growing just not as fast as, as, as a number of periods before, but really uh, a lot of challenging, but at the same time, uh, it showed the resilience of this agreement uh, because beyond the decision of US to withdraw, which was of course a very, very big blow, very big blow. Uh, and of course the active policy of uh, <clears throat> Trump administration to try to uh, encourage other countries to go out and to withdraw from the Paris Agreement like Brazil or Australia or others or, or even Canada, but even Canada was not really well received anyway. So this has proved totally resilient where uh, beyond US there was no sign of getting out because that was for me a very, very strong sign. The second more, even more important uh, positive element is that this Paris Agreement now is a reference not only for governments, where we have, of course, political headwinds, that's just evident, no, because of Trump and because of crisis, et cetera. And because, of course, it's difficult for government to really be decisive and, and really implement their policies in a proper way. But do you see that progressively, <clears throat> this notion of Paris Agreement being the reference is now working for the financial institutions well, evidently the multilateral development banks, the national development banks, we'll see that very soon in November with a big summit on finance in common. You see that the business are referring to Paris Agreement and all of them taking the objective of net zero emission by 2050 as a benchmark. And it's not a global benchmark, it's a benchmark that is that has to be developed for each company, each investor portfolio, each bank, and that of course still confusing. What does it mean? How we do there? Can we do we know how to do it? But the discussion is super super active, mm -hmm. and uh, that's, to, in my view, a very very strong sign that what I was looking for that Paris Agreement is not an intergovernmental agreement, but it is an orientation for the global economy. It's beginning to work. Not enough. I'm not optimistic about the. We are really lagging behind, evidently, but <clears throat> still it's coming in. More as well as important, you see that the number of cities and in some kind of very important actors like state and region, I'm thinking of course of California, are taking this so seriously that they have now clear plans to go to net zero and to have intermediate targets for 2030 that are very, very good, for example, um, banning the combustion engine in city, uh, the cars in cities by 2025 or 2030, depending on the cities, um, and uh, having plans to go to 100% renewable energy, for example, et cetera, et cetera. And we have cities who are already carbon neutral, like Copenhagen, for example, still, of course, buying offsets outside, but uh, with a very, very active policy on transport, on heating, on, on energy, etc. So this is what is happening. And finally, I would say the, the last very important political element is that Paris Agreement is the reference for the a new compact for Europe, which is a European Green Deal. And this has conducted all the discussion in Europe at the 
in a way at the origin of the, co the political compromise that uh, was crafted with the European election and the new election of the new commission. Uh, and that is, is for me the first new big political contract around the Paris Agreement that we can witness. Yeah, thanks for this, Laurence. And, and so adding a, another challenge to the, to the discussion, you know, let's talk about the current crisis. What's your take on, on the effect of the COVID, uh, you know, on the fight against climate change? And do you think that the climate agenda has been pushed to a smaller stage? Are the governments and the, and the private sectors, you know, uh, only focusing on economic growth at the moment? I think it's a very active discussion. <clears throat> my, my first instinct was it will be very difficult, uh, in particular because the level of investment, the public investment to uh, the contrast cyclical, but to try to combat the, the, the recession, of course, which is happening and will, of course, increase in the next months to come. The, the first reaction has been immediately, uh, we should maintain the activities like where they are and we should spend a lot of public money uh, and public investment on the activities, the assets like they are. So nothing about, in the beginning, nothing about the change we need. And with this strong contradiction, which of course there is a limit to the indebtedness of, of government, well, of the nations, and that all this money that is now uh, invested in maintaining the economy structure as much as anybody can know as it is, it is money that would never be spent again on the transition. And so that was of course the beginning of the concern in March. So um, a number of us have been of course actively advocating for, well, if you have to invest this public money, which was not happening before, the massive investment, an acceptance of really relaxing the the budget rules, the fiscal rules. So let it be, but do that in, a, in looking at the future, not at the past. And that uh, the debate is still happening, but you see that the notion of a green recovery has gained enormous momentum, but it was not, it was really very yeah. tricky in the beginning. I can tell you, it was like everybody was saying, we should do that after, not now. And still a very vivid discussion, of course, in France, in, in, in UK, well, everywhere this discussion is happening. But the interesting element is that on both sides, the citizen, and we did a very interesting study recently done by a group, which you may know, which name is more in common together with a big uh, polling agency. And uh, more than 70% of European citizens think that uh, we should not uh, go go back on the on the environment on ecology and ecological transition, but at the contrary, the COVID should be the uh, the moment to accelerate action. So that was a citizen, <clears throat> and they are afraid that, of course, government would drop that. On the other side, you saw a number of companies. I'm thinking about the German companies, for example, sign a letter uh, uh, in Germany to ask the government not to subsidize uh, old sectors or to, to give the money to, uh, again, buying the, the unused cars in the automotive sector, but just to put money in the new sector, hydrogen, for example. And that came everywhere. Now this discussion, how we use in a clever way this money, and we have, a, a, again, a, a, a letter of more 1,000 companies to directed to the president of the European Commission saying, really the, the aid of EU should focus on the new sectors, on the new activities, on the transformation and not buying back the, the, the fossil fuel based sector. So this is a battle, of course, it's an intellectual fight, a judgment, a question about how we protect employment. Uh, so that's not done, but uh, the backlash I was afraid of hasn't come. And that's why this combination of movement on the political side and on the economic side makes that the climate agenda has not disappeared, but it was totally at risk to disappear totally. 
Yeah, that's that's interesting, and we were discussing that also um, the the importance of the moment now, right? Be, when we were preparing, another element you were mentioning is the you know the changing geopolitics of climate at the global level. Can you speak a little bit about that, and in particular of the of the role that other regions might might play in uh, redefining that geopolitics of of climate change? I'm I'm thinking, for instance, of uh, of China and the recent announcement. Yeah, that's, that's a very important feature. Uh, one, because again, six months ago, uh, I was quite pessimistic about this geopolitical evolution uh, because of course uncertainty around the US election on one side, the isolation and the, uh, the, the policy of China who was really uh, no more talking about climate and wanting only to limit its target to what was agreed in 2015, which was really very modest compared to what we need to do. Um, the fact that Brazil was, of course, was, as, as you know, in full disarray and, and really blocking what was one of the more progressive in emerging countries, climate policy, South Africa for all other reasons, uh, Indonesia for, well, there was no Mexico, again, going in the wrong direction. So there was a number because of one on one side, the Trump policy on the other side, the China move, well, not move. Uh, Europe was all totally isolated and still a little bit fragile or uh, on her determination, the determination, its determination of going forward. And then everything finally between April and July coalesced in a very clear statement about the recovery will be around the European Green Deal, whatever the divergences are in Europe. And then, so I began to be more optimistic and of course in the discussion with Timmermans and Michel and von der Leyen, um, the idea is that if we could move from uh, climate diplomacy, which was in a way a little bit limited to, we have to have a Green Deal diplomacy, meaning this is what we will do anyway, that where Europe will direct its economy, industry, finance, agriculture, transport, building, everything. And that will be the, the new compact we, we will have. And we, whatever happened, uh, that's what we decide to do. And if there is not a fair competition, we will even use our trade instrument to protect that direction. And this very strong stance has had an impact on others. It has an impact on Brazil, for example, where a, a number of companies in Brazil began to press one. They, they pressed before uh, because of this anxiety around the trade impact. They pressed on Bolsonaro not to withdraw from Paris Agreement first. And then you see now a number of businesses across the value chain to try to combat the deforestation policy of Bolsonaro. But because of a Green Deal being not only a climate diplomacy, but being an economic diplomacy, mm -hmm. which uh, organized around the first global market uh, of the world still, and still EU is a bigger market at the global level, that has a, enormous resonance. And then, because probably because of, yes, evolution in US, a very strong stance of California, for example, uh, the uncertainty now in a different sense of the US election, China decided within the context of the discussion with Europe to move its target and to propose something uh, from the top that was a condition for all the discussion in China to be reopened, uh, decided to go for this carbon neutrality by 2060, which is what we many were asking already since now, three or four years. And so that's a big, big announcement. It's not complete. They have to revise or to say something about their 14 five year plan, which has to be completed, meaning the decision to be completed by the next spring to go to 2030 target. But the China is, a, and, and I, I notice that it is not noticed enough that it is a big change. It's yeah. a shift. It is a first emitter at global level. It's now the first or the second global econ economy at global level, depending on how you account for it. And, and if you realize that the global market, the, the big market of Europe 
and the China's market takes the same, more or less the same target, that's an enormous sense for the global economy. And that is, in my view, the major shift into re, re, re-engineering a momentum, a political momentum we didn't have, of course, since 2015 because of the US decision. Yeah, do you think that we could have a, a carbon cutting coalition of Europe and China in the future? That's what, you know, was this signal is giving. Mm-hmm. Uh, whatever, in, in any way, whatever happened in the US. Yeah. China has of the US outcome. Yeah. That, that was the signal we were looking for. Mm-hmm. Because without that, uh, even the big effort of some states or some region or some companies in the US, uh, it was a, a major blow again. But if you have the Chinese and the European align, you imagine the sign on the technology, on the global markets, on the value chain, just was enormous. China is the first buyer of anything at the world level. And of course, the first seller of many things. So it's, it's really a, an enormous shift. And uh, I see it will, it will in a way, uh, come to the con- consciousness. And, and again, for good or for, for well, they will, they will fulfill the target, that, that for sure. Whatever the techniques to do that, but uh, that depends. But, um, so I think that's a very, very important signal. And the club we were trying to build is at least uh, the building blocks are there, yeah, which, which is a very important element. So a, a Biden a president cannot go, well, will go in the same direction. Of course, mm-hmm. that's what we should hope for. Uh, but even the Trump administration cannot resist the, the business's direction. And, uh, and in my views, uh, for example, the end of the combustion engine is, is done. And by this, it will be accelerated by this EU Chinese decision, a common decision. Yeah. Uh, just one, uh, one quick note for our uh, audience. Uh, please don't hesitate to ask your questions uh, on the YouTube live. We'll be, uh, we'll be uh, trying. We will be trying to answer as many as them uh, in the later stage of the of the of the discussion today. So yeah, please please don't hesitate to do that. Uh, one question for you, Laurence. Um, you know, we're, recently in France, we uh, we saw the government testing uh, la Convention Citoyenne pour le Climat, uh, you know, which is a democ- uh, democratic approach that invites citizens to come up with proposals to uh, uh, for fighting uh, climate change and. The question to you is, you know, what was the, uh, the inspiration behind it and, uh, and how could we potentially replicate that in other, in other, other regions of the world? Um, so the, the idea, you, you may remember, this came after the movement of the Yellow Vest in France, where there was a big pushback against a particular policy uh, the carbon tax, uh, meaning the increasing of the carbon tax, which of course is involved into the price of fuels, plus the readjustment between the, the price of the diesel and the price of gasoline in front, which is something which is proceed, now, now proceed from, of course, air pollution concern for, for many years now. The protest, of course, degenerated in many things, but mainly around social justice and the feeling that people were not considered that why they wanted to be seen by their yellow vest, that's something very bright. Uh, you may, some maybe remember that then the president organized what he called the Grand Débat, which was a sort of a tour of many, many, many uh, town halls, if I may say so, like compared to what we could see uh, into, um, into in the US in some other countries. Um, but then, the people around the Gilets Jaunes and, and others were feeling that this was not a proper exercise of democracy, of deliberative democracy, because it was not really prepared. It was like a very sort of on the spot discussion with of course a number of these debates occupied by the government itself. So they, they came, I was not, I was involved in the, um, in, in an initiative which is called was Gilet Citoyen, which was the idea we can't oppose, which was my first reaction when I saw the movement. We should not and we can't oppose the movement for social justice with a mo- movement for ecological transformation. And we need to find, which is probably the thing I, I, I pay more attention now for, on, on everything, even of course international diplomacy is important, but I do think that if we don't find a way to 
activate and develop climate policy and climate solution that have uh, the just social justice at its core, I think we cannot bring this social transformation that it is uh, a net zero society is, is, is about. And so I, 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 I participate with others to the creation of a small group linking the yellow vest people, some personalities and, and people who are more on the climate movement saying, we need to find this, this discussion, we, to, uh, at least to organize a discussion. And then the, the, idea, the idea was we have to propose a, 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 a real, very well-informed discussion with citizen selected randomly, like the uh, Irish did on the uh, same-sex marriage or abortion, or and it was in climate on top, or that experience that is, is, has been conducted in some other countries or, 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 or regions. And so the government accepted that, but the condition was uh, if the exercise is properly done with enough time and resources, then the recommendation of the citizen should be presented and uh, there will be no selection, no censor, no, no censure, no censorship on this. It should be uh, uh, transmitted to the parliament and sans filtre, meaning the decision of the citizen should be respected and should be considered very, very seriously. Not accepted necessarily, but seriously. And if they want, we could go to the referendum. So this was the idea of thinking that citizen may have a shift their perception of problems and solution if they have the time to discuss and to be informed. Second, the solution they will propose will probably fit more with where the society is. And my personal engagement in that, as I was sharing this exercise, is that I felt the French society was, and is, in my view still, ahead of the government in his mm -hmm. understanding and even the desire of the social change that ecological transition implies. So that's the reason, the substantive reason was I was in, and, and probably because, of course, if you don't have <clears throat> if you don't have trust between uh, citizen and their representatives, uh, you can't engineer social change. And I don't think, by the way, that social change comes from the top. I don't believe that. I, and in a way, when I was talking about Paris Agreement cannot be implemented by government only, is that the same philosophy? I don't think this is the social change come from a, a, a really a variety of actors and because it feels at the moment and they feel that they are able. So the problem is really to give the, the floor, to, to give the space for these actors to, to express themselves. And the exercise was really incredibly fascinating. So we had 150 citizens selected randomly from every origin, every level of diploma. 25 of them didn't have any, any diploma, even uh, the first level of what you do, do that at secondary school. Um, so something that normally these people doesn't have a voice, they never participate to meetings uh, because that's only more, more educated. Uh, normally goes to the debate, uh, elder, uh, older people with education and, and, and normally men and not women. And this was, we have the same level of women than in the French society, young people that normally don't come to these discussions and the result was stunning, meaning the first day when they were presented with the analysis of the climate problem and the impacts, they, they were shocked, but shocked to a level. I was even surprised myself. And they said, but if this is so bad, and it was purely what was happening already, what was probably happening, uh, depending on, the, of course, the scenario, but the scenario, un unfortunately, are every time worse. They said, why nobody has told us that was so bad. So that was the first reaction. And then they began to work on all these topics because the demand of the government was how we reduce the 40% emission from France by 2030. And they proposed 100 and 149 proposal finally, uh, working like mad. They, they worked nine months uh, not only eight we seven weekends, but more than eight weekends in reality, plus session in between, 
they worked on groups. Uh, the investment, the intellectual and the work investment of people was really, really impressive. And, and when you look at their plan, what they propose, of course, it's very, there are many, many aspects because they, finally their analysis was, we cannot solve this issue with one issue, with one measure, with one policy. There is no silver bullet. It is about a range of changes that has to be brought in the society. And now we are at the moment, of course, where the government has to respond. We will have a, uh, the last session to where the citizen will, in a way, <clears throat> formulate their judgment on the, finally, on the government's performance on vis-a-vis -vis their proposal. And of course, it's still not clear. But what is important, in my view, is we should not, we should pay tribute to the quality of the investment of citizen and their active agency. And you know, everything in the, so in the change we have to engineer in the society comes from the agency of citizen. Mm -hmm. But for a citizen to have agency, you have to give them the space. You can prevent them to have agency, that's very easy. Communication, spinning, uh, constraint, uh, and then that's all. And people cannot then move and take responsibility. But if you leave the space for agencies, then you reconstitute the chain of trust that is lacking now between the citizen and, and again, the political institution or the representative institution or in the society, let's be the union, the, the government, the members of parliament, et cetera, et cetera, and, and even the justice. So this is for me a very, so beyond their recommendation, which many are interesting, and original and doesn't seem for experts like the geeky people from climate would not think that it is that important to control and to um, advertisement, but for them it was super important and they were right. I think they are right. And so this is for me uh, an enormous lesson of uh, the, when you give space to people, they, they are clever, they are responsible and busy, but basically the, the response to them should be a, deep respect for what they do as citizen because they are taking their responsibility. Thanks, Laurence. That, that's uh, quite uh, inspiring to hear you say that. And, and it, we also hear from you that uh, the process changed their, the mindsets of the citizens even involved in, in that process, the same way that the process of the Paris Agreement changed mindsets of, uh, of governments leaders. And, and we have a question coming in from, uh, from um, one member of, of our audience, Anthony John, which is like, okay, we heard about the change of mindsets for government leaders, from citizens. What about economic actors. What is being done now to change that mindset with business leaders? Uh, we have a lot of them in the audience now of that conversation. So what is being done and what do you think, what, what does look mo the most promising from your point of view when we come to business leaders? <clears throat> uh, I think on the business community, um, well, the, in Paris, I, I managed to give them, to have a preparation of the meeting with business only, we have a conference on the business to say what kind of Paris Agreement you, you need to go if you consider that climate change is important. So that's what the, the first steps. And then we, we, in a way, we tried with many actors from the business community, in particular the World Economic Forum, which have been very active, business association, like of course uh, uh, the, the ones who have been created to be more sort of active into the business community, like uh, the, um, <clears throat> the, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, or We Mean Business, which is this coalition of some of the B team. Uh, so there, there was already, uh, and because of that movement around, yes, companies have to have a seat at the table of the discussions, <clears throat> a number of organizations that have produced these coalitions uh, we try, by the way, to organize, before Paris, I, I was involved in some exercise to try to organize sectoral agreement mm -hmm. to get some targets for cement, for example, for, for steel or for electricity. It didn't work well at that time because you see that what is needed is this interaction between the public policy, the finance and the business, and we need these three. And, and I would say now the citizen, and both on the consumer side, as a, but as a citizen side as well. So. Now what the, 
the, the way it is working is we have this, uh, which is interesting. You have a discussion that is very, very, very across the board uh, between business and, I would say, between business and financial institutions. Mm. For example, there are now a number of pension funds that are asking the companies, as you know, around the disclosure on, on the carbon footprint of these, uh, of these companies, um, that an exercise that had been started by Michael Bloomberg uh, a year before Paris to ensure transparency uh, on the assets that companies were holding and how much they were dependent on fossil fuel activities and that the banks and the pension fund and the institutional investors uh, well, well, could measure the risk if they were very exposed to this type of activities, given the fact that at one point in time, climate policy would ob oblige these companies to, in a way, to change course. And uh, that, so that is, a, that is a first package of discussion between companies and financial and investors on uh, but what are the plans of these companies. So the companies now have, because of these demands, of the financial community to present their net zero plans. And you see this flowering. Uh, you see now many companies <coughs> committing for net zero. Uh, and now of course the next step is, so, okay, that's nice. Very nice objective, how you do it. So what is the plan? Huh? So I, I think this is a movement that has been generated in, in part by the, <coughs> well, the, the demand, how you implement Paris Agreement in your own with many, many channels and now reinforced by the question of the investors. Uh, and you may have seen, for example, a very important pension fund like the Japanese one, which I think is the public, so it's uh, bigger at what level, saying uh, for the moment our portfolio is pointing to uh, an increase of temperature in three, de of three degrees compared to pre-industrial level. We have to really go back to two or under two. So that's the risk we are taking and that's where we put pressure on the companies. Some others are uh, trying to use the shareholders of companies to present and to defend pro-climate choices in the strategy. Uh, there is now the, even the institution of a, in the UN process, which is, an, is important, of course, nothing UN for companies is totally central, but it's important that so uh, climate champion has been designed that every for two years, um, somebody will be in charge with a team to collect engagement, to encourage um, companies to move forward. And that, that for example, uh, um, an, an, a UK citizen now, Nigel Topping, who is doing it. Uh, and um, and um, so the, the, this is a way that, for example, now for the Glasgow COP in 2021, in November, uh, has been organized this notion that everyone has to present the plans to go to net zero, which the name is Race to Zero. And I'm sure many companies have heard about that. And then can I you see... Give a, sorry. Can no, you give no. us a, can you give us illustrations about some companies you find inspiring in really pushing that development of plans towards net zero? Um, still, of course, a little shaky, but you see, uh, you see companies like the, I, I just forget the name of the steel company in, uh, in Sweden, which has introduced this hydrogen uh, pilot company, who has now a clear plan. Uh, you, we, have, um, um, we have some companies like ArcelorMittal, who, who wants to be net zero to, to produce steel, not in India, but outside. Mm -hmm. um, we have, of course, companies that are always being the leader, like Unilever, who has a very comprehensive net zero plan, in particular insisting on deforestation, combating deforestation. Uh, of course, there are oil companies like BP, who has proposed to be net zero, made switches in particular to production of renewables. Uh, we have other companies like, uh, we have some electricity company uh, we are now, I think, very, very more, more serious about that. And um, so there are a number of, but we, we are in, um, that's a moment where we have a number of companies that have said they will be net zero or they are net zero. But now it's a delicate moment where they explain how they do that. 
and that's the credibility of this plan, which is, and I don't think I have a total view of yes, there is a champion there, uh, because that's uh, the phase was until now to say, to compile in a way the commitments. And now this phase is how we make these companies accountable and who is making the companies accountable and who is the third right. party checking. And we are in, in full mode of that. I'll take a, another question from the audience. Uh, Romain was asking about, you know, the, our, the way our economies function today, we have a culture of growth. Right, so how do we achieve those targets uh, without shifting that culture of growth? And uh, when all the, you know, the, the KPI that business uh, corporations are are uh, are following, you know, is there any uh, alternative targets, alternative uh, KPI that we should uh, look at in order to achieve those those those, those targets? That's a, of course a very central question because you you see that if we don't change the way people make their judgment on what is profitable, what will be. Uh, and, and even if we know that the judgment are informed by very partial type of indicators or, and, and we can have many examples of that. And the problem of the growth in general is of course the acceptance that we have a limited quantity of natural resources we can use and still our growth is based on the extraction of these natural resources. So I think this is needing a very deep discussion and for the moment this discussion has stayed in academic circles. We have uh, many economists, even very bright ones, Nobel Prize, that have been thinking we should now look growth differently and we should totally change the indicator of what we call growth uh, because the quantitative expansion based on natural resources is just an impossibility. At least for 9 billion people at the world level, it's just an impossibility. Uh, but it's very difficult to get out of this uh, because how we, we know a, only a linear thing. We, 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 we don't measure the success by uh, more depth into, I don't know, the achievements. It's about expand, uh, physical expansion. And so um, I think it, I, I don't know how, but it's a condition. If not, you're totally right, we cannot. Uh, so one response is we should grow some activities and degrowth and diminish some ones. So we grow the activity who are not, of course, have an impact on the extraction of natural resources. Uh, who use a full recycle of this, which we can make an enormous progress on that, evidently. Um, and maybe energy is not a limiting factor. But at the same time, even if you feel that energy, because we can have clean energy, is not a limiting factor, <clears throat> it needs space, no? It needs space. Solar panel needs space. Uh, wind farms need space. Uh, even nuclear power needs space. Well, you need space. The nuclear depend a little bit, of course, on extraction of uh, uh, limited resources. But um, so we need to understand what do we want to grow as element of the well-being of the societies. And I, I know that is super difficult. Well, I think we can have the academic discussion. I think we, we can have a number of elements that we are not more happy because there are more cars in the street, which more air pollution, even classically the GDP will increase if the pollution increase because that just means that we will burn more oil. Uh, and that does, in terms of well-being, is, is negative. But then how we, we don't price clean air and we don't price the silence in cities, uh, even if we know that in terms of public health, we'll see the, the negative numbers piling. And so it's really a sh reshaping of the thinking. And But I, I look pessimistic, but I'm not, because I think this is happening and this is while well, this discussion is happening I, I recognize that it's easy for government to dismiss that discussion say just it's ridiculous you want to go back to Lash de Caverne or something where you didn't have electricity in your home of course it's this is not that but what we consider that very important good certainly we see that with a pandemic that health is an enormous strategically important, vitally important good for everyone. But we may feel that other goods are important like clean air, silence, relation to nature, uh, education, 
um, in material consumption, once of course the basic needs, and maybe the basic needs are not to change your iPhone every two years or every one and a half. Or, or, so but that's the conception we have to correct. And companies so let's are me, imaginative to what they want. Yeah, to let's me pick that. up on that. Uh, you know, what you can do, you know, not change your iPhone in, I mean, not in a, in a jokingly way. There is a debate that's going on now in the chat. Yeah, it's heated um, on the chat right now. <laughs> yeah, it's heated it's like where a... basically, you know, some are, um, are, are just um, calling and asking for... Uh, a gr big global wave of citizens committing themselves to uh, to really reducing their own emissions and making that the key push towards that and not leaving it in the hands of politicians. On the other hand, we have others saying, yes, this is all good, but we know that um, the sum of these individual action will not keep in mind global goal and systemic, systemic risk and opportunities. And actually, we've had that debate on a number of conversations with, we've organized. So bottom top uh, i mean so what's your what's your take on that how do you uh, <clears throat> how do you uh, respond to that uh, to that debate and try to bring people together around something like that i think it's very uh, we have to be sophisticated intellectually uh, that's very dialectical we know that and change doesn't happen like this revolution comes come in the in the broad sense can come from many sources and this accumulation of small events that makes a big change is never one um, so uh, no leader, uh, enlightened leader, will, will make the change. Hopefully not. I, I, I'm not in this, of course, conception. Um, but so um, I, I do think that the citizen movement is central. I can take a very concrete example. The citizen movement in Germany has changed totally the relations that the German, the German government is very, as you know, uh, conscious of the value of their industry and sensitive to the arguments of the industry. And until the youth movement, that was the only voice. And then there were two aspects that have changed that. One that some of the sons and daughters of the, of the leaders of this German industry went to the street and asked their parents what they were doing. But what were they doing? on one side and then the, the you know the young are voters as well and you can't say as a government i don't consider youth young people it's just like you say i'm, I'm not consider what i pray what i say every day is that i'm looking for the future of my country and then you have the future who's saying you are not doing the job <laughs> and that has changed totally even conservative guys uh, I would not cite names in the German government, but we were really reluctant to everything on climate. And then the shift, of course, supported by the chancellor and the feeling for the, from the business that they have to shift as well. That's why this is this cumulative movement where uh, you may have business resisting because of the, the representation they have or the profit, etc. The citizen movement makes them change their vision or maybe destabilize the condition they have and then there is a positive loop on the government so i believe on the loops and that's why we need and, and that's why I, I do that job now that i am no more in government if we have to act on every every place because i don't know and again it will be opportunity it will be you don't know something will happen that combine that create this positive loop and we have at the same time to combat the negative one, because they are very negative ones. Isolation, isolationism, nationalism in some case. Uh, uh, well, you know, you look at the US situation and you are afraid. Climate now is a polarization, political issue, polarized totally. Uh, now, you, to, if you are anti-climate and anti-mask, it's an identity issue. So we have to combat these things, this misinformation. I think we should spend millions and billions of dollars uh, of resources on misinformation because people, they are isolating, well, that I'm saying something which is so trivial, isolating their bubble, they, they, they look for conspiracy theories. Uh, it's still a minority, but it's a strong minority and it creates conflicts. And so, uh, so we have one to use a positive loops and at the same time, we, we really have to be very careful about the negative ones, which are sometimes at the same time manipulated. Look at the discussion for pre-Brexit. 
uh, everything was used in a way that identity was to be against everything, Europe, climate policy, everything. So, <clears throat> so that's my, so I don't think there is any contradiction where you are, you have to do the job where you are as a citizen anyway. And we are all citizens if we have the agency to move from consumer to citizen. Uh, but then you are in some place in society and do your job, no? I think we are all responsible and it's not about countries or uh, you, we are. And, and if we are, you know, the, the, the individual action cannot deliver much. Huh? Uh, there are many studies you can do if you are really, really very sensitive to climate, at least you can maybe reduce your emission by 15 or 20 percent with an enormous discipline. But the rest you can't. So what do you do? You can do that, but for what? For the sake of asking the other segment of the society to be consistent because you are making the effort. So I'm not a recipe, but anyway, it's like Le Paris de Pascal. We don't have the choice. We don't have the choice. And we have to continue whatever we will succeed or not. I don't know, but we don't have the choice. I can, I think so. Could, could you give us a, a few examples of uh, countries that managed to establish that positive look? You were, you were, you were um, talking about Germany. Uh, who else in your opinion is, uh, is leading uh, in that field. Uh, with all the political contradiction, I think for the moment UK in this in this direction, even if it's super complicated because of the COVID crisis, the management from the government. But you see that the the civil society movement, which was very strong in UK, combined to the scientific uh, structure which advised the government, and the fact that uh, even the Conservative Party has bet that if he wants to get the young voters, he has to have a climate program. We see now that really UK is doing well on the on the on, on the on, on this direction of, of climate policy and achievement because they now, of course, I know that they are discussing about opening a new coal mine. I hope they will renounce that, but they have shifted really for a coal-based electricity to a renewable electricity mostly. So I think UK is, a, is a, again, contradictory, difficult, but it's an example of a positive loop. Uh, I see Ireland in, in that direction as well, where, where the citizens are really actively pressing. Um, and again, of course, Sweden and Denmark, where, where of course the citizen has always had a huge pressure on companies and on the government, and with, with I think, a lot of success. What we have to see if this happened only in Western Europe or uh, or elsewhere, which is of course, uh, what kind of positive loop you have. I see good elements, for example, in Kenya or some, well, Kenya is a good example where citizens have fought against some coal installation to get more clean energy and they won uh, through litigation, by the way. Um, I see uh, really uh, NGO fighting in India on having clean air and cities. So we see that, but of course, depending on the political regime, the capacity of citizens to have agency, it's changing. But for the moment, uh, I, I think, uh, again, the Green Deal is a product of citizen mobilization, which was indirect or direct. And that's why it, it has stayed like this. It's not a top-down element. Exactly. It, it was really a bottom-up one. We, even though we, we'd like to stay here forever, we're going to have to wrap up. And so my final uh, question before Kevin wraps up, uh, my final question for you, uh, Laurence, I mean, you've been, you've been in this for, for a long time and you're still in the thick of it and pushing all the efforts and bringing your energy. What, what is making you the most hopeful today um, really to achieve progress towards the Paris Agreement? I think the fact that it's no more an isolated thing in the UN mm. conference and that the discussion is everywhere, that my first uh, element of optimism. And I see that now people are linking a number of issues, biodiversity, protection of nature, social justice, everything with climate. It's not something in a bubble. It's something that con connect us all. And I think that that's what makes me feel that we may be able to change. We may fail, but we may be able to change because we see that it is a, something we everyone can act upon or have an idea or push for something. Thank you. 
Thank you, Laurence. Uh, it was uh, really uh, such a pleasure to be uh, to be hosting you today. Um, I think now it's the time to wrap up. Uh, I'm trying to reflect on what I've heard today. Uh, there's uh, there's so much content that that, that you shared with us, uh, Laurence. Um, I return a few points. Um, <clears throat> You know, first we started by talking about the Paris Agreement and how it was important in in in, in the role it played to change the expectations at a at a global uh, at a global level. I think uh, you know, trying to to move away from a point where it's only the countries that can actually afford that shift that would be leading the way to a, a point in which actually no, it's actually all the countries that should be cont contributing to that effort and and move from. Um, a, a, climate equals to no uh, no um, economic development to a, a different perspective on you know a different uh, uh, development that was the kind of you know main one of the main uh, 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 i would say uh, uh, issues tackled by, by the paris agreement and it was successful in that aspect um, and also how it was a start to creating a self-fulfilling prophecy and, and the narrative that we, 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 we share about, uh, you know, those are the, the goals that we should, uh, that, that, that we must have. And this is the way we're going we're gonna to be able to, uh, to, uh, to achieve them going by a step-by-step -step sequential approach, showing that we can actually learn in the process and make more and more uh, progress uh, in the years to come. Um, you spoke about, I mean, I, I, you know, that positive loop is something that, that I'm going to go uh, go home with tonight. I think uh, this this uh, this vision that actually we shouldn't have been uh, calling this talk, uh, you know, uh, creating a change maker mindset from the top and the bottom, but rather from the bottom to the top. Because what I heard what I heard today is actually there's a lot that most of the of the government led actions actually were. Uh, were were pushed by the citizens, and you mentioned the, the, the Green Deal. Uh, uh, you know, first of all, so uh, how do we create those loops where both the action from the government are fed by the citizens, and so, and vice versa, the uh, the commitment from the citizens are actually also inspired by government action. And I think that's one of the key uh, the, the key issues we have today is how do we uh, make sure that we create those positive loops everywhere in Europe and in other other regions. And also what's, what's really interesting is to see, you know, uh, we're entering a phase where uh, that, 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 that debate used to be a, a thing uh, uh, that would be uh, mainly, I would say European. I mean, Europe would have the lead on, on this topic, but now we see a lot of uh, involvement from stakeholders from all over, you know, all over the world and uh, geographies. We saw last week the commitment from China to be net zero in, tw in 2060. Um, which is quite quite re remarkable for a country that is responsible, for, you know, of about twenty eight percent of gas emissions. So uh, there's a lot to be hopeful for, and uh, and uh, and uh, and yeah, and thank you again, Laurence, for for sharing those uh, those uh, your, your insights with us. It was really fascinating. Um, I'll be um, quickly before before I think I tell you have a few uh, 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 events to share with the audience that are coming up. But just before that, I'm also uh, very happy to share a few uh, a few news on our side. Uh, you know, Change Now is uh, organizing the the largest uh, um, gathering of change makers in the world in in Paris next March from the 9th to the 11th. And uh, Laurence, by the way, you are most welcome to attend and participate and share. Your amazing insights with the audience will be uh, will be very uh, pleased to uh, to have you uh, with us in March in Paris, um, and also uh, please follow us this week. There will be some novelties, that some some news that we'll be sharing about the summit, and in particular some novelties about this year's format because I'm you know sharing a, a little bit of a teaser here, but it will be the first time this event is multi-site uh, with an incredible lineup of uh, emblematic partnering venues, and we'll be sharing more about this uh, our plans uh, by the end of the week. So yeah, be make sure to follow us, uh, follow the news on our site, and and yeah, um, I leave the floor to you, Katar. It was such a pleasure to be teaming up with you again, and um, and uh, and yeah, I can't wait to hear more about the next events lineup at INSEAD. 
Thanks, Kevin. So as Laurence said, we're all trying to create some space for uh, active engagement of citizens, is respective of uh, which function they have. The, we, we are, for the second year in a row, bringing the INSEAD community and beyond uh, to try to take action towards pushing for net zero in 2030. Our second community impact challenge will be focusing on sustainable food habits. This year, everybody's warmly invited to join it. It is again trying to break down the different steps we need to take as individuals and what we can push in our organization towards uh, um, uh, being carbon neutral in 2030. So please join us in that uh, endeavor. And we'll be discussing uh, also in the context of business education, the sustainable development goals. Obviously, climate being a cutting issue throughout achieving all of these goals. We'll be having a series of conversation about how to bring that at the heart of business and the heart of organization in the first week of November. So also join us for this. With this, I think it's time to wrap up. Thanks, Laurence. Great seeing you again. Thank you for being an inspiration um, to all of us and for pushing on the agenda. Thanks, Kevin, yeah. for organizing this uh, conversation with us again. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the discussion. Bye.